All right, well, welcome everyone. We have a few people that are not normally here, one all the way down from Kentucky. And so we want to welcome her here. Now, we did not meet last Wednesday, so I'm not going to go back and minister that message tonight. If you want to pick that up, it was from chapter 3 of Song of Solomon. It is up on my page, my Facebook page, as a live stream, but also Joanne put it up as a YouTube presentation. And that message was simply in chapter 3 where it talked about the fact that we are the watchmen. And, and the watchmen back there means the military police. And so the way I minister that is how you are your own popo. <laughs> you're your own popo. You're, you're the watchman. It's your spirit that, that watches uh, for your life and so forth. And so I'm not going to go back and repeat that. As I said, if you want to see that, you can go to my Facebook page, watch the live uh, presentation we did, or go back to YouTube because it's also on YouTube as we taped it down in Portland at the church as a live stream presentation. She put the live stream presentation on. So we're just going to get right into Song of Solomon tonight. We are doing a series, as you all know, on the mind-brain connection. And we're studying in the Song of Solomon. Now, the Song of Solomon is a love story for us, to us, and as us. And there's some wonderful things for us to glean from in the book of Song of Solomon. Now, we've shared with you how that we have always been one. We've never been separate from the Father. We've always been one. But what you see in the book of Song of Solomon is a people that consummate the marriage. In other words, there is that which is symbolic of the right side, the Christ mind, the single eye, that we incorporate over on the left side. God gave us the left side. Nothing wrong with the left side. We have intellect. We have natural reasoning. So there's nothing wrong with the left side because we need a brain. See, but the mind of Christ is within our spirit, and as we slip into the mind of Christ, it does affect our brain, and our brain controls our body. So the two go hand in hand. So what we're going to do is begin here in chapter 4 of Song of Solomon. And what we see here in chapter 4 is the king is describing her from head to waist. Now why not from head to toe? Why is the king only describing her from head to waist? Well, simply because it has not become a walk yet. And then later on, we're going to see that she describes him in the next chapter, but she describes him from head to toe. Why? Because it's a walk. It's the walk of Christ. So I want to just begin reading here in Song of Solomon chapter 4 as we begin to look at this, and it'll take us a little while to get down to where uh, she's described, a couple of verses at least here. But again, let me just repeat this. He is describing her from head to waist. Not from head to toe, because it has not become an experiential walk yet. She hasn't consummated the marriage yet. She hasn't brought the Christ mind. She hasn't slipped into that Christ mind. She isn't exercising the single eye as of yet. She's just simply learning about it. So look what it says there in chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Thou hast dove's eyes. In other words, you have the ability to see by the single eye. You have the ability to see by spirit. That's what dove's eyes mean. So, behold, thou art fair, or beautiful, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Now, that doesn't sound like a very nice thing to say to a woman. Doesn't sound like a compliment to say, well, you got goat's hair. You have hair like a goat. Well, when you understand what he's really saying allegorically, because remember, in the most holy place, one of the levels of the covering of the most holy place was dyed goat's hair. So what he was saying to her is, you are a habitation for me. See, because the most holy place signifies habitation. It signifies the house of God, which we are, the most holy place does. So he's giving her a compliment by saying here that her hair is like a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. He, he's simply saying, you are a habitation for me. Then verse 2 says, thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing, 
whereof every one bear twins, and none is barren among them. So once we come into this experiential union, we're already one, as I said, but we're consummating the marriage, we're bringing that incorruptible seed within our spirit over into the female part, the feminine part. This is the masculine part, this is the feminine part. So there's an intercourse going on where the incorruptible seed of God is being planted, as Jesus said when he talked about the sower sowing the seed. He used the word ground, and he used that as an example of taking the seed on the right side, the incorruptible seed, planting it into the ground of our heart or into our awareness, and then we have fruit. We bear fruit. So this is what it's talking about where it says, Everyone bears twins, and none is barren among them. Now, verse 3 is what I really want to focus upon and get into. Look what it says here in verse 3. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. So verse 1, when he says, you're fair, my love, he's saying you're beautiful, you're gorgeous. When he talks about the dove's eyes, he's telling her you have the ability to see by the Spirit, or you have the single eye within you that you can utilize as you look at things in the appearance realm, you must look at them through the single eye. So that's all that he's saying there where he talks about you have dove's eyes. And then he talks about her hair, and of course we know that hair can be symbolic of covering. And the hair, when he talked about her having the goat's hair, it's talking there about the fact that the covering that she has is the experience that she has in him. Her covering is Christ. You see, that's why the scripture says the man is the head of the woman. And that's not talking about in a literal sense, but it's talking about Christ our head. Christ is both head and body, you see. And so when he talks about the hair, he's talking to her about the covering, which is the experience of the most holy place. And then when he talks about teeth, what are teeth? But teeth we use to want chew on things. So he's not talking about chewing literal food, but he's talking about her teeth being able to chew on the truth. See, and I think this is what it means where it talks about, you know, people experiencing uh, of course, they teach it with hell, but um, people experiencing weeping and welling and gnashing of teeth. When do we gnash our teeth? When we, you know, a lot of times people have to wear a, a mouth guard because at night they, you know, they grit their teeth or they gnash their teeth. And that's because, see, they couldn't gnash their teeth if, if there was food in their mouth, you see. So when it talks about teeth, it's talking about, and here it's talking about her chewing on her oneness. Chewing on her oneness. And then it talks about not being barren. Well, of course she's not going to be barren. When, when she has experienced the right coming to the left side and swallowing up all of the false concepts and ideas of the left side, what is she doing? She is bearing the nature of Christ. She's bearing Christ. She's birthing him. He's reproducing himself through her, and she is bearing. She's not barren. She is bearing. And see, this is what it talks about in Revelation chapter 12, it talks about the sun-clothed woman. It says she has a crown of 12 stars upon her head. 12 is governmental authority. She has the awareness of governmental authority. The moon is under her feet. In other words, her emotions are under her feet. They're not, she's not living in and of her emotions in and of themselves, but you see, spirit is controlling her emotions. And that's what it means in Revelation 12. When she bursts the man-child, the moon is under her feet. Her emotions are under control of the spirit is what it's really talking about. So this is what it's talking about here in the first uh, two verses. Now look at verse 3 again. It says there, Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, <clears throat> and thy speech, listen to this, thy speech is comely, or it's beautiful, Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. Now, calmly here means good looking, means beautiful, it means nice. And remember back in chapter 1, she said to him, I am black but calmly. And we found out that the word black there just meant that she was merely living out of the intellectual side. But when she said she was calmly as well as black, that simply meant that she realized the potential within her to no longer just be living out of the intellectual realm, but to be incorporating the right and the left side together. In other words, I'm black, 
I'm right now I'm just living out of the intellectual realm, the left side, but I know there's this potential of the right side for me to live out of the right side. And that's what calmly means there. And then also it goes on to say, by lips are like a thread of scarlet. Now, what are lips? Of course, everyone knows about lips. Lips are what we use to speak. Lips are what we use to give outward expression of what is true of us inwardly. As a matter of fact, in Matthew, it says, out of the abundance of the heart, awareness flows what? Our words. Another one in Psalm says, out of our heart, awareness flows the issues of life. So lips here, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Lips give outward expression to that which is true of us inwardly. Now, let me read another scripture. I'm not going to have you turn there, but in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 19, it says these words, The lips of truth shall be established forever. The lips of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. So the lip is described as used for either speaking truth or lips can be used for speaking error. See, And so back here in Song of Solomon, in verse 3, chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet. So lips are used to what? To speak either truth or error. And depending on what we put in our heart awareness, that's what we're going to automatically speak. So it talks about her lips like a thread of scarlet. So what is a thread? Well, we all know what thread is for. You use a thread to sew pieces of material together. So the thread here holds our life together as we speak forth the truth. And then it uses the word scarlet, and of course scarlet is a symbol of divine life. So our divine life is held together dependent upon what we speak out of our lips. You see, if we put within us the truth as opposed to error, and we speak that out, then what's going to happen? It's going to be as a thread of scarlet. It's going to hold our divine life together. See, and what we have to do is we have to look at these verses of Scripture allegorically. We cannot look at these verses of Scripture in a literal sense. That's where people get in trouble. That's where people get in all kind of trouble, and you have all kind of situations, you know, in religion and so forth, simply because that's why we have, you know, a lot of people teaching es eschatology today they have their charts and they line you know their charts up and talk about jesus splitting the eastern sky and coming back on a white horse and a rapture taking place because they're simply interpreting the word of the lord literally instead of allegorically symbolically spiritually or parabolically so what verse three there where it talks about the lips as a thread of scarlet it's conveying to us that that which we express which is divine truth is good and it'll hold your life together. Thy lips are a thread of scarlet. They're like a thread of scarlet. And then it goes on to say, and thy speech is calmly. In other words, your speech is beautiful. When you put the truth within your heart awareness, the ground of your heart, you will automatically speak the truth. <clears throat> you won't have to try to speak the truth. It'll automatically and spontaneously flow out of your life. And it will be that which holds the scarlet or holds the divine life together. But now notice verse 3 doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate within thy locks. Now, if I would ask you tonight, where are your temples? There's only one place on either side of your head. Now, what do the temples signify? What do they allegorically speak to us of? The temples speak of your consciousness. They speak of your consciousness. Now, let me read another scripture in Mark 14, 58. And this is Jesus speaking, and you're all familiar with this. He said, I will tell, or you tear this temple down, and I will rebuild it within three days. And what was he talking about? He was talking about building a temple not made with hands, but a temple that was eternal in the heavens. As 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us, it's a house. We are a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. So that's what Jesus was talking about there in Mark 14 and verse 58 when he said, tear this temple down and in three days I'm going to build it up again. I'm going to build another temple that is not made with hands. So what is the temple then? The temple that he's wanting us to see here 
in Song of Solomon chapter 4, the temple is you and I. We are the habitation of the Father. We've always been the habitation of the Father. We're the house of God. We're the house not made with hands. And that's why Jesus could say, call no man on earth your father. You have one father, which is your heavenly father. Now, notice here, it says here that the temples, our consciousness, in other words, is like a piece of pomegranate. Now, pomegranate is a very interesting fruit. It has within it thousands of seeds, thousands of seeds. And what I think about the thousands of seeds is in John 15, where it talks about fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. So this says that our temples or our consciousness is like a piece of pomegranate. In other words, we have all of these seeds on the inside of us, all of this truth and all of this revelation that when it is brought from the right side over to the left side, it's going to bear fruit that remains. That's good. It's not just going to bear fruit that's here today and gone tomorrow. You're not going to have one experience, for example, you know, maybe you got a healing through someone laying hands on you, and uh, a year or so, it's no longer there. Mm. You know, that's fruit that is here today and gone tomorrow. What we're after is experiencing fruit that remains. Yeah. And so this piece of pomegranate, our temple, our consciousness is like a piece of pomegranate. Hmm. Meaning that there are many, many thousands of seeds of revelation that are sown into us so that we can be about the Father's business in bringing forth not just 30-fold or 60-fold, but a hundredfold fruit to the glory of God the Father. Now Jesus said it this way. He said, remember when they uh, fished all night and they hadn't caught any fish and he came up to the disciples and and he said, what I want you to do now is cast your net to the right side. Mm -hmm. Cast your net to the right side. And remember, they caught 153 fish. And if you add 1 plus uh, 5 plus 3, you get 9. And 9 is simply the number of consciousness. So this is talking about our consciousness. When you see the word temple or temples, right away you can realize you are the temple of God and you are the consciousness of the Father. See, we are consciousness tonight. Can you think for a minute what it would be like if you didn't have any consciousness about you? You couldn't know the Father. You couldn't experience what we're talking about. You, you would, you'd just be, you'd fall over there. If you had no consciousness because spirit is simultaneously can be used as, as consciousness. So if you didn't have any consciousness about you, you couldn't even breathe tonight. You wouldn't even be alive tonight, see? So we can see the temple is similar to consciousness. So when you see temple, think of the fact that you are his temple. Think about the fact that you have temples, and temples speak of consciousness. Now notice he doesn't stop there either, but he goes on to say in the rest of verse 3, within thy locks. Now, locks denote several things. One of the things that locks denotes is intuition. Locks denotes intuition, and hair can infer intuition. And you know, to a Nazarene, to the Nazarene people, you know, like Samson was a Nazarene, Jesus was a Nazarene, and they didn't cut their hair. Paul cut his hair. Why did they not cut their hair? Because, listen, the hair speaks of that which grows out of the higher realm. So there was a sect of Nazarenes like Samson and Jesus that did not cut their hair because to them it denoted that which grows from the top. A consciousness that comes out of the, the highest level that can come out of. Now, uh, Paul shaved his hair just like the Buddhists today shave their hair. Why? Because that sect of the Nazarenes believe that it represents just intellect. So you see, they're going to shave their hair. And that's why Paul did. And that's why the Buddhists do that today, you see. But here's the thing I want to point out. Where it mentions the locks in verse 3, this is symbolizing that the seeds of your salvation and my salvation flow from the divine consciousness or the divine awareness and from intuition down to. See, when you see someone that has locks, what do you think about? You think about, oh, and you may say, oh, they have long flowing locks. So what is it talking about? What do the locks speak of here where it talks about thy, within thy locks? The locks are talking about a flow from the right side to the left side. See? From the right side, there's a flow that begins to take place. And what happens then, since hair also means intuition, your intuition becomes very keen. 
Intuition is in spirit. It's of the right side. But when you bring it over here to the left side and it swallows up all those false concepts and ideas and connects with the virgin consciousness, what do you have there? You have very keen intuition. And you begin to see the purpose of God and you begin to see and you begin to experience the manifestation of that which is within or that which is from the right side. And this is why Romans chapter 8 talks about the manifestation of the sons of God. Christianity must be brought to this. People are starving today. They're shooting up. You have as many drug houses in the United States of America as you do grocery stores. Why? Because the world is in chaos. It's in a mess because we haven't taught people who they are in Christ Jesus. And if we don't begin to teach this, we're going to have more problems. But listen... Thank God there's a people that are looking through those situations in the outer realm and they're really beginning to see the whole earth full of the glory of God. They're beginning to see people whole and complete. They're beginning to judge them not according to sight, not according to the hearing of the ear, or not according to the seeing of the eye. But you see, the problem has been Christianity refuses to inform people of these truths. See, and the, the longer we go without teaching these things and showing people it's not about just, you know, flying out of here to some heavenly glory. You know, the longer we go and don't teach people that salvation has nothing to do with, you know, when you die or pie in the sky or a rapture of the church. Unless we can teach people that it is something that we can experience in the lovely here and now, we're going to continue to have the perpetual problems but thank God that's changing and the people Amen. are beginning to teach some of these things. They're not afraid to stand up and boldly declare these things. And the whole planet's beginning to resonate. Now, I say it this way. I believe that because we have left Pisces and Aries and we're now in the age of Aquarius, which means enlightenment. I believe that there's an enlightenment that is upon this earth. And people are beginning to wake up and be enlightened in the economical realm, the medical realm, the social realm, in all realms of life. But now listen, if we want to experience this spiritually, it's more than just, you know, experiencing the age of Aquarius, although that's awesome. We must still turn in and tap. Imagine, imagine in this age of Aquarius what can happen in the lives of the people that learn to live from the inside out. Yes. And begin to view things by the single eye. And begin to slip in to the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. And begin to not judge appearances by the seeing of the eye and the hearing of the ear. But judge or discern righteous judgment. Imagine what is going to happen. And see, this is what we need to begin to imagine. Right. You know, I shared with you a couple of weeks ago how the, the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant uh, means apprehended ones. It's speaking of us. And another meaning for the cherubim is divine imagination. See, our imagination, which is a part of our Christ mind, has got to get involved. And that imagination has got to be brought over here to the left side, to where we imagine even on the left side. And as we do, we're going to see things begin to really, really heighten as far as the experience that we have in him and the experience that other people have in him as well. Now, here's what I want to get into because this is the title of the message. I want to talk about the armory of God within you. You are an armory tonight. Now, the National Guard, they keep their weapons in the armory, and it's in a higher place. It's in a, and it's in a, a, an upper room, if you will. And so I want to show you the rest of this message tonight how you are the armory. Just like we looked at you were the watchman, you are the armory tonight. And you have weapons within you, but not weapons to fight. And that's what we're going to talk about. So look what it says there in verse 4. In verse 4. It says here, it tells us the neck or thy neck is like the tower of David builded for an armory whereon there hung a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. So the armory is you and I tonight. But let me back up and talk about the neck. It says thy neck is like the tower of David. So what is the neck? What would you think a neck is all about allegorically? Well, the neck is that which is between the physical and the heavenly. Between the lower thoughts and the higher thoughts. The neck, in other words, is the crossing point. It's the bridge between that which is of the flesh realm, thinking fleshly thoughts, and that which is within the higher thoughts or within the mind of Christ. 
See, that's the neck. It's the bridge between the physical and the heavenly. It's the bridge between thinking from the left side and thinking the Christ thoughts. Now, we hear a lot today about, about tithing. People in the church, in the religious church, and I've come through all of that uh, Babylonian baloney as well. And we have thought that tithing is giving 10% of our income. Well, the New Testament doesn't teach that. The New Testament says we give as we propose in our heart. We give as we're led by spirit, by Christ's mind, you see. But tithing, we found out, is the giving of the 10% or that which touches the earth. Now, the tithe in the Old Testament was that which they gave, the 10%, which was what grew from the earth. See? So what grows from the earth realm here on the left side in our thoughts, the false concepts and ideas, that's what needs to be tithed. Because this side grows from the earth, just like they tithed in the Old Testament from that which grew from the earth. And then they would also come and offer, you know, their, their lambs or their turtle doves or depending on how much money they had, they would offer a, an animal which represents us offering or laying down the beastly thoughts of the left side, you see. And so as we look at the tithe and as we look at the offerings that they offer, we can see allegorically that it's talking about offering the 10%. That's the tithe. And you know, in Malachi chapter 3, where everyone uses that for the tithe, they say, well, you can't rob God, you've got to give your 10%. Well, it didn't even say that. What it says there in Malachi chapter 3 is, do not cover God. The word rob is cover. See, you rob God by not giving your tithes. Well, you cover God, the Spirit of Christ, by not offering this 10%, by not yielding up that 10%. So this neck, again, where it says, Thy neck is like a tower of David builded for an armory. Again, the neck represents the difference between, and you know, even there's even a veil here between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere called the arachnoid. And I truly believe that as we come into a greater enlightenment, this veil is getting thinner and thinner. But so what the neck is talking about there, and the ancients knew this, the neck is talking about that bridge or that crossing over from the carnal thinking over to the spiritual thinking. And it says we give the 10% or yield up the 10% then, that we allow the thoughts of Christ to come and to swallow up all of that 10%, all of that lower thinking there. Now, let me read another scripture. I'm not going to have you turn here either because I have a lot to share tonight. But in 2 Kings 17 and verse 14, concerning the neck, listen to this. It says, Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. So they hardened their necks. What does that mean, they hardened their necks? They didn't cross over, you see, from the lower thoughts to the higher thoughts. And so if we don't cross over, if we're always thinking out of the left side, we can get very hard, very judgmental. And that's what religion has done. But if we will allow that 10% to be swallowed up, then the neck represents that crossing over to the higher thoughts. And our, we won't get hardened, see we won't, we won't be stiff-necked. I think the New Testament uses the word stiff-necked. Why? Because they, 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 they were intent on continuing to think out of the left side. Let me give you another one here. In Genesis 33 and verse 4, and this is where we see Esau and Jacob meeting one another after a long time of separation. And look what happens. It says, Esau ran to meet him, to meet Jacob, and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Now, they, Jacob and Esau had some bad dealings with one another, and they had some trouble. But the time came when they came together, and Esau falls on his neck. Meaning what? There was a crossing over of living on this left side over to living on the right side. In other words, loving. Now, we can see this in, in Luke chapter 15 of the prodigal son. We know the story how the prodigal, you know, got an awareness of the left side and he wanted his inheritance and he left home and so forth. Then one day he realized that uh, he's in pretty bad shape, so he heads back to the father. And remember, the father wouldn't even let him confess. I mean, he had his confession ready to give to the father. His father would hear nothing of a confession, but it says his father fell upon his neck and hugged him. What does that represent again? The neck, it symbolizes a movement upward and it indicates moving from a lower realm of thinking 
to a higher realm of thinking. And of course, we know that the father certainly had a higher realm of thinking for the so-called prodigal son. Mm -hmm. So that's what the neck represents. Now, let me go back to Song of Solomon again and read that verse, chapter 4, verse 3. And it says, Thy neck is like the tower of David. Thy neck is like the tower of David. Now, what was David's job? David was told that he was to keep places safe, keep the land safe for God. He was to fight the wars. He was to watch for uprising. In fact, it states in Scripture that he could not build. Remember when he came to God and he wanted to build the house of God? And God said, no, you're a man of war. Your hands are bloody. You cannot. You cannot build the house of God. And you see, the Scripture tells us that David was a shepherd. He kept the sheep. What do the sheep represent? Thoughts. So David was a shepherd and he kept his thoughts. And while he was keeping his thoughts, what took place? He watched. He took care of the land where there would be uprisings and wars and so forth. So then Solomon was the one, and Solomon's name means peace. Solomon was the one that could build the house of God. Now what am I saying? You cannot build your house if you're living over here on the left side, the lower thoughts. You have to build your house with peaceful thoughts over here on the right side. Can't build it. David couldn't build the house of God. Solomon, meaning peace, was the only one that could build the house of God. And of course, you know, we could take this into the Christmas story where it talks about the astrologers who are watching for the star to go, you know, find baby Jesus. And I guess it was about two years uh, after Jesus was born that they found him. But you know what? They were really astrologers. We call them shepherds, but they were astrologers. And what were they doing? They were keeping their thoughts as well. They were shepherds keeping their sheep, keeping their thoughts. And when they saw the star, then they followed that star and they came and they found Jesus. So again, what is this neck? This neck, where it says here, is like the Tower of David, which it's rising above. In watching, you have to rise above the thoughts of the left side, and you have to be thinking out of the thoughts. You have to be keeping your sheep on the right side, and then you can build the house of God. So what have we seen so far? The expression that would come off of your lips listen, is the divine expression that will hold your divine life together and it'll fill your mind, your awareness with seeds of life so that you can turn yourself away from everything that would come from the left side. And the neck is nothing more than you moving from one side, the left side, over to the right side. And this is exactly what Jesus meant when Jesus said, take no thought. Take no thought. If you're going to take any thought, it better be thoughts from the right side. That's what Jesus said when he said, take no thought. And we've talked about, you know, the Greeks having the five levels of, of consciousness, which is earth, and then uh, water, and then air, where you take no thought, and then fire, where spirit is really moving in your life, working in your life, and then the mind of Christ. Now, we've got to the place that I want to talk about here. Look what it says there in verse 4. Build it for an army. You are builded, as it says there, let me read the whole thing, thy neck is like a tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. So builded for an armory. Again, what is an armory? An armory, as we well know, is where the National Guard keep their weapons in a high room. And so what verse 4 is conveying to us is that within us is a high place. And in this high tower of the neck, as the energy crosses and begins to rise from the solar plexus up the spine or up the energy fields, when it comes to the sixth, which represents all of man and creation, and then it moves up to the seventh, which represents the Sabbath, then what happens? It throws open the armory where all the weapons are. But again, we're going to talk about this, not weapons that you fight anything with. That energy, as it flows upward from the solar plexus up the energy fields, comes up to that seventh chakra, which speaks of, or the seventh energy field, that speaks of rest. And don't we need rest in our body? You know, in religion, we've talked about, you know, God's will is forced to be healed and have health. But we don't want to talk about the scientific experience of that. We want to leave that alone. That's too new agey for people. 
But this has nothing to do with new age whatsoever. But as that energy begins to flow up, it begins to tap into, or it begins to affect, if you will, the pineal gland. Mm. And we found out then it affects the pituitary gland. And one creates a substance that is a milky color. The other creates an oil or substance that is a goldish color. And there you are finally experiencing then the land that is flowing with milk and honey. Mm -hmm. And what does it do? It exposes you to the army, armory, army, <laughs> the armory. It exposes you to the armory where all of the weapons are. Mm -hmm. Now, Isaiah said it this way because I don't want to think that this armory has weapons that, uh, you know, we use in the energy of the flesh. We're going to talk about that as we go on. But this is the way Isaiah said it. He said, I want you to take your swords, beat them into plowshares, and study war no, man, no more. Mm -hmm. So let me just say, what this constitutes, what the weapons constitute are the seeds of the pomegranate the truths, the many thousands of revelations, if you will, the many seeds of the pomegranate that we receive where it's associated with the temple, which is associated with consciousness, which is associated with lips, which is associated with thread or holding things together, which is associated with scarlet divine life. And all of that goes into us being the habitation of the Father. It all goes together. The neck crossing over from the left side to the right side and so forth. Now, let me have you turn here. Leave Song of Solomon and go to 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. As we talk about the armor that you and I are. As I said, when the energy flows up the energy fields, it's going to throw open that army. It's going to reveal that armory. I keep saying army. It's going to reveal that armory to you where the weapons are. But again, they're not carnal weapons. And I want, to, I want to show you this very clearly tonight. We do not have to fight anything. Religion has taught us you've got to bind, you've got to loose, you've got to fight, you've got to, you know, whether you're fighting demons and devils, nothing could be further from the truth. If you run reference on demons and devils, you'll find out it will bring you to the word mindsets. And I want to show you this here. So our weapons are not carnal. We're not fighting against people. We're not fighting against demons and devils. We are only, and we're not even fighting, I'm going to show you we're not even fighting, it is about what we have allowed from the left side into our head. Now, look what it says in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare, where are they? The weapons of our warfare. Where are the weapons? They're in the armory. And listen, and the armory is at the neck, which crosses us over from the carnal fleshly thinking to the spiritual way of thinking. And so it states here, for the weapons of our warfare, now li listen to what it says, are not carnal. They don't have anything to do with the left side. They don't have anything to do with people, fighting people. They don't have anything to do with fighting demons and devils. They don't have anything to do with the IRS fighting us or the government fighting us. They're not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But notice what goes on to say, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are strongholds? It's those thoughts on the left side. It's only your thinking. <laughs> Hello. It's only our preconceived ideas, our religious ideas. It's only the false concepts. That's what the strongholds are. And notice it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of these thoughts. And that's something you do. And you do that through meditation. You do that through slipping into the mind of Christ. You do that through exercising the single eye. Now, if you'll hang on to 2 Corinthians 10, go quickly to Ephesians 6 and verse 11. And I want to show you tonight that you, when we get finished with this message tonight, I want to show you that when we talk about the prayer armor, which Ephesians chapter 6 talks about, I want us to see that you are the prayer. You're every piece of the armor. We don't do prayer, we are prayer. Let me say that again. Prayer is not something we do. Prayer is something we are when we have this revelation that we're talking about. Prayer is something we are. We don't have to do prayer in the sense that we've thought religiously of prayer. We are the prayer. But look what it says here in Ephesians 6. 
verse 12. Verse uh, 11 says, put on the whole armor of God. Verse 12 says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. What does that mean, we wrestle not against flesh and blood? It's not about people. It's not about the government. It's not about the IRS. It's not about demons and devils or entities outside of us. See, Jesus said it this way. It is not that which is without that defiles the man, but that which is within. In other words, within his thought processes. That's what defiles a person. Not something on the outside, like a demon or a devil or this or that, okay? Now, let's read on verse 12. It continues to say, For we wrestle not against flesh or blood, or that which is some so-called outside forces, but... I'm glad the butt's there. That's a mighty big butt right there. But against principalities, now be careful how you hear this, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, where? In high places. Now where's the high places? Right here. In other words, it's a perceived power. It's a perceived principality. It's a perceived ruler of darkness. It's a perceived in your head, in my head, spiritual wickedness of some sort. That's all that it is. Now, when the weapons are listed there in verses 14 through 17, we can readily see that each of the weapons have to do with the right side. Has to do with the right side. Now, here's the way I used to teach this. I remember teaching, and not too long ago, the armor of God. And I said to the people, the armor here is not defensive armor, like a gun or some artillery, you know, that uh, the National Guard keeps in their armor. It's not that at all. The armor is not defensive army or armor because we're not fighting. But then what I would say is it's offensive. But wait a minute. It dawned on me a week or so ago, how could it even be offensive? Because we're not offended by anything. Hello. Blessed is he that is not offended by anything. Why? Because we know it has no power. Isaiah said it's, a, it's nothing. It's a no thing. Yes, things can exist, but they have no real power as God calls real. Uh, Hezekiah, when the armies were coming against Israel and his men went to him, scared to death, and said, what are we going to do? The armies are bigger than us. We're going to get slaughtered today. He went to the father, and the father said in Hezekiah, it's nothing but an arm of flesh. In other words, what he was saying is it has no stinking power. So what am I saying? I am saying that, listen, the armor here in Ephesians chapter 6 certainly isn't defensive because we're not fighting, and it's not even offensive because we're not offended by anything. Why? Because we realize nothing in and itself has any power except the power we give it by believing on the left side that it has and that it is a power. Now that's good news. Now, so when you go through this, and see, and Jesus, listen, I said from the keyboard a couple weeks ago down in Portland, we are the prayer that Jesus prayed that was initiated or inspired by the Father. So we're the prayer answered. We're Jesus' prayer answered that was inspired by the Father. So we're the prayer of the Father. So what I'm saying here tonight is when you have this understanding and live from the inside out, you don't really do prayer in the sense of how we used to think of prayer but you become the prayer. And you can walk into a room, and as you walk into that room, people can sense peace. In fact, there's a scripture in Revelation that talks about the Lamican company, and it talks about the, their presence as they go, you know, here and there, that people, you may not even open your mouth, and people will sense the peace and the love of the Father and the grace of God flowing out of you. Why? You have become the prayer because you understand these things that we're talking about. So let's just kind of look at this armor a little bit. I'm not going to read these verses, but in verses 14 through 17, it's called prayer armor. And as I said, we are the prayer. When we understand these things, it's not praying as we were taught by religion to pray. We just see the whole earth full of the glory. We just see people totally complete. We see people one. And that constitutes prayer in and of itself. That is you becoming the prayer. Amen. Oh. Now the next one is the breastplate of righteousness. Mm -hmm. How many believe that you came here as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Amen. We never were unholy. We never were unrighteous. We never had a sinful nature. We never had an Adamic identity. All that's religiosity. 
Amen. So we are righteousness. The scripture says we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and always were. So we're the breastplate of righteousness. And when you know that, it protects your heart. And things begin then to flow out of the heart. We're the, and I taught this years ago. I taught where well, we're the feet company. When you see a normal birth, the last thing that comes out is the feet. And the scripture says the first shall be last and the last shall be feet. Uh, feet first. <laughs> the last shall be first and the first shall be last, right? And the last thing in a natural birth is the feet. Yeah. We're the feet company. Come on. See, we're the expression of the Father in the earth. So what does it say about the feet? It says they are their feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Mm. So you don't just have peace, you are peace. Once we understand these things and they're quickened within our heart awareness, we walk as peace in the earth. We walk as love. You know, Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. He said, you are those things. See, now think, think, think how that works when we've come into this understanding and this experience. The next one is faith. See, people say, well, you've got to have faith in God. No. There's no faith in God. We have the faith of the Son of God. It's not faith in God, it's the faith of the Son of God. And guess what? We are the faith of the Son of God personified as we live from the inside out. And then the next one is the mind of Christ, or the helmet of salvation. What is that talking about, the helmet of salvation? That's the mind of Christ that we not only have, but that we are. And then it says we are the, it talks about the sword of the Spirit. Now all of this so-called armor, these so-called weapons, are in our armory. And we are the armory, you see. Mm. And so the last one there is the sword of the spirit. What is that talking about? The sword of the spirit. Well, the sword is the word of God. Right. So what is the spirit? It's the word of God quickened to us, not only on the right side, but quickened in our heart awareness. As we allow that right side to swallow up all those false thoughts mm -hmm. on the left side. Mm -hmm. So wear this armor. Now listen to this. In Psalm 23, David said... He has prepared a table from me for me in the presence of mine enemies. What's the table? The mind of Christ. What's the enemies? The lower thoughts. So he's given that to us. Not only It's not only something we have, we are that. Yeah. You see? And as I said before a couple of weeks ago, we, we don't have any enemies as we think of people being enemies. Our enemies are our lower thoughts. See? And he set before us this table and all of this armor in our armory. And as I said, as the energy begins to flow up the, uh, the, the energy field, what is it going to do? It's going to throw up in the right side. It's going to cause the, the pineal, the pituitary to work together. And we're going to have the experience of the energy. And it throws open this right side where all of the so-called weapons are. But it's where we come to realize that all of these so-called weapons are who we are. It's who we are. We don't just have these things. We are these things as we come to this realization. We are peace. We are love. We are salt. We are light. We are the sword of the spirit. We are the mind of Christ. We don't just have these things. And again, it's not even offensive weapons. It just is. See? We're not offended by anything. Why? How can I say we're not offended by anything? We don't, what it means is we don't give any power to anything. We don't give any power to sin, sickness, death, situations that appear or loom up before us to challenge us or to tempt us. Now, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 as we try to wind down here a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. And look what it says here in verse 5. We read, let me go back and read that. In uh, the beginning of that, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 said, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay? So here we're going to talk about the casting down then of imaginations. Okay? Where are imaginations? Well, they're on the left side. Right? Now, again, we're the cherubim, and we have, and cherubim means, also means divine imagination. You see, So we can either have vain imaginations on the left side, or we can slip into the divine imagination. Cherubim means, one of the meanings is divine imagination. 
So are we thinking the thoughts of the vain imaginations by giving things a power that have no power? By hanging on to religiosity and all of these concepts that we were taught in religion? Or are we exercising the divine imagination that we have in the Christ mind? So look what it says there, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imagination, listen to this, and every high thing, every high thing, what? That exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. Now, notice those three words, casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God or the right side and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience, bringing into captivity over here, these thoughts over here on the left side, bringing them into captivity to the, as it says there, obedience of Christ. Notice imaginations, knowledge, and thought all has to do with something between our ears. It's all in the head, folks. It's all in the mind. It's all in the head. And so that's why it's so important for us to continually slip in to the Christ mind, continually exercise the single eye, continually be in that spontaneous meditation, especially when something of a negative nature rises up and looms up before you. We must exercise the single eye, live from the inside. And the more, you know, I believe it this way, the longer we stay in this and live out of this, the greater we're going to experience Amen. the yes. manifestation. As Romans 8 says, the whole creation is on tiptoe looking for the manifestation of the sons of God. So are we. Yes. We're on tiptoe looking for the full manifestation within our lives as well to where we come to the place to where we exercise and where we bear fruit that remains. So where is the armory? It's above, up above the neck tower, above the crossing plate. Now someone Googled at our church on... Uh, Sunday evening, I talked about the fact that even in our neck, between our, the high part of our neck and our head, there's a literal plate here. And one of the gals Googled it. I, I can't remember, Candy. Do you remember the word that she found when she Googled that? But the, it was some type of a plate that, that is in our neck. And so what is this armory? And where is this armory? It's up above at the neck tower, above the crossing plate, where we cross over from the fleshly thoughts over to the spiritual thoughts. So my advice tonight is get up in the armory and stay in the armory. Because that's where the oil is flowing. That's where you're going to experience the land flowing with milk and honey. And when you do your meditation, especially when you do it in the dark, and the Word of God talks about this, doing it at, in the night seasons upon your bed, that's when the pineal begins to produce this melatonin that kills cancer cells, that swallows up heart blockages in the valves of the heart and so forth, that balances the circadian rhythm, that lightens the skin. Come on. And now, why do I want to have lightened skin? I make a little joke about the fact that I don't like to go out in the sun. I always put, you know, uh, sunscreen on because I, I don't like the sun giving me more wrinkles than what I already have. But, you know, what, what is the lightened skin? What is that about? Well, do you notice people that, that, are, that are healthy and people that have a young look? I don't care if they're 90 years of age. They can still have a young look because we're in the ageless one. The, the skin is normally lighter. The older you get, the darker the skin can get. Right? So this melatonin does a whole lot of things. There's a whole lot of uh, benefits, medicinal benefits that go on within the skin. Now, let's finish this. And this is why I believe that Jesus said, you know, physician, heal thyself. In other words, don't always look for someone to lay hands on you to bring a healing, but live out of your own well. Physician, heal thyself. Why? Because when we live from the inside out, then you see, we speak our own deliverance. We live our own deliverance. We, we walk our own deliverance. Now, let's close this. Verse 4, the rest of verse 4 talks about, talks about this armory. And it says, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Now, what is a buckler or what is a buckle? A buckle represents life currents. Where do you wear a buckle? You know, around your, around your waist. And, you know, as I said Sunday evening that, you know, people can have a long tail shirt on. And in the front, they'll stick that shirt in if they have a nice buckle on their belt. For example, I have a nice peace buckle. You can't see it on YouTube, but I have a nice peace buckle here tonight. 
So I wanted to make sure my shirt was tucked in so y'all could see the peace buckle. Now, where is it? It's, and usually you wear a belt to hold up your pants so your pants don't fall off, right? But it's around the belly. And buckle represents life currents. See? And so out of your innermost being shall flow liver, livers, rivers of living water. Out of your innermost being shall flow. Your livers, yeah, you're all livers. <laughs> we're all livers. Not the physical organ, the liver, but we're all livers, you see. And out of our innermost being or out of our belly, as the scripture says, flows rivers of living water. You know what? He could have just as well has, have said, out of your solar plexus flows rivers of living water. Now notice it says there again, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Now, the mighty men there are currents of the mind because men generally speak of the mind as a whole. Women speak of emotions and the desires of the emotions, but once the emotions are under the control of the spirit, you see, then the daughters or the women, because remember at one point the daughters of Jerusalem were charged by the hinds and by the rose, that, and that was our message that we would have done last week. But the daughters of Jerusalem, which represents people in the outer court or people who are religious people, or even people of what we'd call of the world, they were charged by the rose and the hinds to raise up higher. Titanium plate, yes, that was what was in the neck. They were charged, these daughters of Jerusalem were charged by the rose and the hinds, and the rose means fish eggs. They were charged to come up higher. The daughters of Jerusalem were charged to come up higher. And they were charged by the rose, which means fish eggs. In other words, there needs to be something birthed from the invisible to the visible. You know, you don't see a chicken birth something. You know, I mean, where does the egg come from? When the chicken, chicken births an egg, it comes from the invisible realm, comes to the visible. So the daughters of Jerusalem were charged by the rose, the fish eggs, birthed something from within, from the invisible realm, from the inside, and by the hinds, and the hinds speak of the feminine principle. So they were charged to come up higher. And how were they charged to come up higher? By birthing something from the invisible, but by also involving the feminine part. Remember when we talked about, uh, we were talking about uh, the fact that we, we are the, we are the popo. See, we, we are the popo, we, our spirit is the popo, our spirit is the watchman. And then we talked about the fact that uh, you can't have one without the other. See, we quoted that Frank Sinatra song a couple weeks ago. You can't have one without the other. In other words, the feminine part is just as important as the masculine part. See, as in the natural, so in the spiritual. You can't have a child without sperm being inserted, in, impregnating the womb of the woman. In the same way as in the natural, so in the spiritual. So now these mighty men here, they were flowing where it says, whereon they're hanging a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. What the mighty men here are referring to allegorically is just simply they were flowing from the inside out. The belly, out of your innermost being, out of your solar plexus. See, where the, where the belt. And that's all that that's talking about, where it talks about these mighty men being, uh, you know, having these bucklers and, and they were mighty and they were strong and they were shields of mighty men. It's just talking about people that are flowing from the inside out. Now, in closing, one more verse. Thy breasts, verse 5, thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins which feed among the lilies. Now, what are breasts? Well, breasts, we know, simply represent that which produces milk. And, of course, the scripture in the New Testament talks about the milk of the word. And we talked about the fact that when the oils in our body, when that uh, you know, energy begins to flow from the solar plexus and it engages the pineal and pituitary gland, gland, there is a chrism or there is a colostrum that begins to flow. And mothers that feed their infant babies when they're first born and they breastfeed them, in that colostrum, it's called colostrum, in that colostrum is every known vitamin mineral that that baby's going to get. So think about every known vitamin, spiritually speaking, and mineral flowing from our pituitary and from our pineal as the energy begins to be raised up from the solar plexus. As the belly, where the buckle is, as the belly begins to give out and flow as rivers of living water. 
So verse 5 says, Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins which feed among the lilies. And of course the rose here, let me talk just a little bit in closing about the rose. Back when the daughters of Jerusalem were charged to by the rose and by the hinds to rise up higher, I shared with you how the rose there mean fish eggs. In other words, they needed to come to the realization that they needed to birth something from the inside out. But the rows here that we see in verse 5 represent gazelles. Gazelles. Now, what is a gazelle? A gazelle is something that dances and prances on the mountaintop. And, and they say that gazelles, you know, they, uh, the characteristics of the gazelles are characteristic of a people that live from the inside out. The gazelles, that's what it's talking about there, where it talks about, let me read that again. Thy two breasts are like two young rows, or gazelles, that are twins which feed among the lilies. In other words, which continually feed from that which is pure. Lilies represents resurrection and that which is pure. They continually feed from that. So in closing, let me read that again and give you the definition. Thy two breasts, in other words, the source of divine food, the milk that the colostrum that has all of the nutrients and all of the vitamins, spiritually speaking, are like two young rows, or they're like these gazelles that climb up the mountaintops. They climb up to the higher realms, which are twins. What are the twins speaking of? It's talking about the masculine principle, and it's talking about the feminine principle. Because you've got to have two. Which feed among the lilies, or which feed on resurrection life, on the right side. Which feed upon that which is pure. That's what it's talking about there. It's talking about feeding from within. Feeding upon the quickened word that we are. Jesus was the word made flesh, and we're the word made flesh as well. See, so as we feed upon the lilies, as we feed upon resurrection life, as we feed upon that which is pure, not tainted by man-made concepts and religiosity, but that which is pure, then we're going to experience this that we're talking about. The marriage that we already have, we're going to be consummating that marriage. In other words, we're going to be walking in these things. It's not just true about us, but we're really experiencing it. And you see, that is why that he only described the woman from head to waist, because it hadn't been a walk yet. But when she describes him, she describes him from head to toe. It's a walk, you see. Now, let me close with this. Verse 6 says, Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Now, what is this talking about? Until the day break. Until whatever it is you're going through that appears to be a power or appears to be a darkness in your life. Until the day break, whatever appears in your life, stay in your meditation. Don't ever get out of your meditation. Now, the myrrh represents, we looked at this before, the myrrh and the frankincense. The frankincense represents the inward reality of the word that's quickened within you. But the myrrh represents the reality that is expressed in the outer realm. The manifestation that is expressed in the outer realm. Now, some time ago when we started the series of teachings, we talked about the, the Christmas story where the wise men came from. It says they came from the east. And east means the dawning of a new day. Now, let me just turn this around because any time that you are facing north, any time you're facing north, what is to the east or what is to the right? The right, you see. We're talking about the right hemisphere that represents the mind of Christ. Any time you face north, to your right is the east, and the east is the dawning of the new day. And that's where we're at today. We're living in the dawning of a new day. And that which is the frankincense, that word that's being quickened within us, is now finding expression as the two become one and the marriage is consummated, finds expression in the outer realm. Hmm. Now, verse 7. I've got to have at least two or three closings here, so verse 7 will be the last one. Thou art, thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. Now, let me just say that love there, thou art all fair, my love. Love is the feminine principle of the divine consciousness where you dwell in meditation. And listen, when you dwell in meditation, there is no room for spot over here. <laughs> There's no room for spot over there. You have no spots when you dwell in meditation. When you take no thought, when you've raised up, you see, to the level of the air and you take no thought, there's no spot. Because the only thing that is a spot are your thoughts. There's no spot. 
You've come to that place where you are experiencing no spots whatsoever. Now, this is what we want to experience. As I said, we can be a Christian, call ourselves a Christian, waiting for the glory train to take us out of here, waiting to die, and all of a sudden something's going to happen within our lives. And I'm not saying that things don't. I'm just simply saying that cannot be our hope. Dying and flying cannot be our hope. Salvation is for now. Now is the day of salvation. Not in the sweet by and by. It's not about Jesus physically coming back on a white horse, tooting the golden trumpet, and making everything right on the earth and in our lives. It's not about that whatsoever. Not when he's placed everything within us that we need to live and walk this life today, to experience salvation. So what am I saying? I'm simply saying, yes, we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, we've always been one. Yes, we are holy ones. Yes, we are the city of God. Yes, we are a Melchizedek priesthood. Yes, we are all of these things, but unless it becomes a walk, if it's just a talk, then we're just talky-talkies. I want to be a talky-walky. <laughs> Is that all right? I want to walk this here in shoe leather, here on this earth, not depending on someday in my future, because what does it say in Proverbs? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. In other words, when we push it off into the future, that's why we're ill spiritually, and that's why we're caught up in all this religious Babylonian baloney that we've been caught up in. So we're living in a great time of enlightenment, an awesome time of the revealing of who we have always been in Him. So I believe we need to just take advantage of it and allow it to change. Now listen, the only place we're changed is in the awareness. See, Paul said it this way, wake to righteousness. And here's what the Greek says. King James says, wake to righteousness and sin not. The Greek says, wake to righteousness, not sin consciousness. That's really what it says. Wake to righteousness. See, and that all takes place on the left side. That all takes place over here in the feminine principle of our being. Amen. Hope you enjoyed that. Father, we thank you. We praise you for who you are in us, as us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your spirit. That is that which is within us that quickens this word to our hearts, to our awareness, that we cannot just know about these things, but we can know them intimately in our walk. We thank you. Thank you for this people. We bless you. We honor you. In the name of the Lord, amen. Amen, amen.